Hi students, Professor Matt here. Today's lecture is on deconstruction or post-structuralist theory. Now post-structuralism, as its name denotes, comes after structuralism, it's post. And so what it did is it built off the um, findings of structuralism and it began to question those basic findings and assumptions of structuralist theory. And so rather than focusing on how meaning can be tied down or can be um, expressed as a deep structure or a binary opposition, it, what we get in deconstruction is in rather a deep skepticism. The, the belief that meaning is not secure, but rather meaning is very fragile. And we can mark the, the beginning of deconstruction theory back to 1966 when Jacques Derrida gave the lecture Structure, Sign, and Play in the Discourse of the Human Sciences at John Hopkins University. It was supposed to be a coronation of sorts uh, to the structuralist Claude Levi Strauss and his findings, but rather it ended up being a dethroning because what we get by the 1970s is a shift from structuralism to deconstruction in academia. Now, of course, a key figure here is Jacques Derrida, uh, and his work challenged the notions of truth and objectivity. So questioning the, the very basis of whether we as humans can know an absolute truth um, and a, a secure sense of objectivity. And of course, the, the answer in a deconstructionist way is of, we cannot know that. Um, the structures that were supposed to give us meaning were supposed to express uh, human thought, language, and of course texts as having um, some secure center of meaning. Uh, in fact, in deconstructionist theory, proves to be highly unstable. And so this difference doesn't tie meaning down, but rather destabilizes it. Take, for instance, the meaning of the word difference. There's two possible definitions of that word. One is to differ, so something is good because it's not evil, it's cold because it's not hot, right? That's that sense, uh, state of negation or difference. The other one is to defer, so to hold in, in check or in parentheses, to delay, to wait, is to defer something. And so you can think of, of deference um, if you were to look up the word morose. Say, what does the word morose mean? And you look this up in the dictionary and find out that it means lugubrious. Well, that's not helpful. What's lugubrious mean? Well, lugubrious means melancholy. What's melancholy mean? Well, melancholy can mean morose. can also mean pensive. So does that mean that morose also means pensive? Um, but of course not. And this is sort of the wormhole that deconstruction opens up by saying how meaning is never really tied down in any of those words, but it's always deferring it to something else, or it's differing in its state of negation. So meaning is always in a constant state of negation and deference. Uh, Derrida's notion of deference dismantles what existed before, sort of logocentrism, the idea that signs can re reference an object of truth, and this objective uh, absolute truth can be knowable to humans. But if instead, deconstruction emphasizes the fragility of these binary constructions. Uh, another deconstructionist move would be invert the hierarchical value of a binary. So good and evil, obviously, we have good being the favored binary over evil. Um, but what the deconstructionists would do is show that either, you know, you can't really have any good if there's not evil. Right? It, it's sort of a package deal. There is no such thing as good unless there's evil. Um, and so it, that deconstructionist move shows how one binary, one term of the binary can't exist without the other. Um, another deconstructionist move would be to show how sometimes evil is really good and sometimes good is really evil. And so these are, are more fluid categories. It's not this uh, distinct difference between the two, this sort of gulf between them where good is over here and evil is over here, but sometimes there's evil and good and sometimes there's good and evil. Um, and so in this way Derrida also showed that existence, um, that th there's no transcendental meaning to existence, right? And so this was a sort of a scary notion to a lot of people. Another key figure in deconstructionist post-structuralist theory is Michel Foucault who is a sociologist, philosopher, and he examined the multiple ways in which power is deployed in society and showed how texts can help constitute and perpetuate social structures that exist. Um, and for Foucault, truth is always socially constructed and contextual. So like Derrida, truth is not absolute, it's not objective, it's something that's contextual and socially constructed. 
Some of the key principles of deconstructionist theory, one is that there's no transcendental signifier. Again, there's no absolute meaning. And this was sort of a, a scary concept to a lot of people because transcendental truths tend to underlie most of our belief systems. Things of a philosophical nature, religious nature, scientific nature, rest on the notion of empirical or absolute sort of meaning. Uh, and rather, the deconstructionist move is to show how truths are rather contextual, how they are the result of relationships among signs within a system that allows for play, that allows for uh, meaning never to be really tied down, but really destabilized. And so this was sort of a, a scary insight, not only for religious individuals, but scientific um, individuals or those that prefer a more classical form of philosophy. Um, the second key principle, although relationships among signs account for contextual meanings, those relationships are never fixed or never fully knowable. Again, they're not absolute, they're not objective. Third key principle, texts betray the traces of their own instability. So the one thing that kind of ties deconstruction to other literary theories is that it does emphasize a close reading of the text. That's sort of the one principle that all the theories rely on, is that we need a close reading. And again, we get that from the formalist tradition. Um, but the, the texts betray their own traces of instability. So that's to say that when you do a structuralist reading and you find this deep structure, you find this binary opposition that's operating, um, the deconstructionist move would be to show how that binary opposition doesn't really fully account for all the meaning in the text. So the structuralist would tend to say, you know, th this binary good and evil helps explain the text in a really deep and profound way. And the deconstructionist move would be to say, well, no, that's not really a very good way to, to look at it. Um, it also shows how these are valid, value judgments. They're purely contextual. And the binaries tend to privilege one term over another. But again, we can easily invert that hierarchy. The fourth key principle is there's nothing outside of the text. And that's a, a phrase taken from Derrida's writing that uh, its intention is to move the, the critical focus away from the author and put it on the text. So again, deconstruction is a, uh, a philosophy, it's a criticism that emphasizes the text. The fifth key principle is that the deployment of power is polyvalent, which means that it goes in at least two ways. So power is generative, it empowers some, and it's also impressive, oppressive, so it does not empower others. But power is never unilateral in its consequence and context. And so the sort of social value of deconstruction theory, because many tend to fear that the only path of deconstruction is the path towards nihilism. So if we, if we deny a transcendental signifier, if we say there's no absolute or objective meaning, then the only conclusion is that nihilism, that everything is meaningless. Um, and that might be one path that you could take on the road of deconstruction. Another path would say that, well, okay, there's nothing that's absolute, fine. But there's still a, a lot of useful things that we can do. There's sort of a, an ethical turn that you can take in deconstruction to say, well, we need to re-empower those who have been oppressed. And so, you know, possibly one example of that might be usurping racial slurs. So taking those, those words that are used to denigrate uh, a social class or a race or an ethnicity and taking those words away from the, the powerful and giving them back to the oppressed so that they can um, regain control over their lives. Um, you know, in words, that might be one thing. It, it could be capital, you know, if you want to combine deconstruction and Marxist, right? We need to redistribute the capital from the powerful to the oppressed. Um, and so there can be sort of a, a social critique or a social ethical turn of, of deconstruction, and it does not have to lead down the path of nihilism. All right, so um, you know, I'll, I'll conclude with uh, a sort of humorous anecdote about deconstructionists. There uh, tend to be a, a person who sits around all day talking about how words have no meaning, um, how communication is impossible, and then they go home at night and they order a pizza and expect that something hot and delicious will arrive at their door in 30 minutes. Um, and that, um, I believe that anecdote has some merit. So this is Professor Matt signing off. That's all for now.